Hello and welcome to today's video on how to validate your family tree. Now if you watched my genealogy with me last week you'll know that this is currently an exercise I'm undertaking on my own family tree or rather the maternal side of my family tree um, basically just to make sure everything's correct and also see if I can get lines a little bit further but I thought what I'd do today is talk you through exactly what validating your family tree means. So let's get stuck in. So what do we mean when we say verifying your family tree? What does that actually mean? It basically means that you are checking to make sure that all the details that you have in your tree are correct and that you have looked for at least, but preferably found every single um, record that relates to your ancestors. So as you can see, as I've said here, um, especially when you're starting out, you tend to rely on other people's research. Um, and part of the reason for that is, is because sites like Ancestry make it so easy to do that. It's not just, you know, everyone sharing their family trees on sites like Ancestry and, and Family Search and such. It's also that Ancestry's hints function is kind of generated by what records other people have selected. And that can mean if they've selected incorrect records for their own family tree, you can then get those as hints for your family tree and you might make the same mistakes because you're going to assume Ancestry as a reputable organisation has are telling you the correct... Um, the correct sources. Well, that's not necessarily true. So it's really important um, if you're going to continue with genealogy and make sure your family tree is correct to check everything. So the best way to make sure that you verify your family tree correctly is to, first of all, make sure of what information you have for your own family from who's better, your own family. So if you have living grandparents or even just your parents, just ask them what they know about their own family. If they know who their grandparents were, what they know about their grandparents. If you're lucky enough to have a surviving grandparent or even great grandparents and they can tell you something about what they know of their own relatives and ancestors, that's pretty much the best possible source because they know, they know who brought them up, they know who raised them, they know what stories they were told. Um, that's how I got into genealogy, by listening to those stories that my dad told me and I really re regret that I never actually asked my grandmother or my grandfather about their, um, about their histories, so I kind of, although my dad got it from his parents, I hadn't ever had those conversations with them um, and I never met one of my grandfathers and one of my grandmothers died when I was very young so I only had one grandparent from each branch of my family that I could have asked and I didn't take advantage of that so yeah if you have them ask them before it's too late. You may be in a situation where you don't have surviving grandparents or maybe you don't know who they were. Um, if you're an adoptee, obviously you don't know anything about your family. If You might have been able to get hold of your birth records, your original birth record, but that's all you have. Um, and if you're like me and you just didn't take advantage of the opportunity to ask all the questions, then the next step is always to go to source documentation. So for that, the best thing to do is first establish what source documentation should be there for each particular ancestor and then search for it and if possible, get hold of a copy. So the best records for this purpose are your civil records and your census records. So by civil records, we mean birth, marriage and death records census records in England survive for, from 1841 
up to 1921 and we also have the 1939 register as well. You might also find that you're able to find military records or probate records for your ancestors and they can also have useful information in them. And the other method is DNA um, and you can use any combination of those. I like all of them, <laughs> unsurprisingly. Um, so we'll come back to the DNA point, but let's go and just look at the source documentation and what it can tell you. So firstly, your birth records. Here's an example of a birth record. This is my ancestor, um, Elizabeth Child. And you can see here from her birth certificate that it gives the name of her father, Thomas Child, and her mother's name, Mary Child, formerly Lazenby. So that's telling you that she's now Child because she married Thomas, but her maiden name was Lazenby. It also gives you Thomas's occupation. He's a coal miner. And it tells you, whoever the informant was, it tells you where they were living at the time. Now, because this is an early record and it's from a very small area in Yorkshire, it's not giving us too much. It's just saying that Maria registered the birth of her own child and that she lived in Aberford, which was also where um, Elizabeth was born. And the other obvious, obvious bit of information it gives you is um, the date <laughs> that the child was born. So Elizabeth was born on the 11th of January, 1867. Now, obviously, this slide is quite small for you um, and the writing isn't clear. And because it's a direct copy of a historical record, you might find that they are quite hard to read. Um, in that situation, um, I would use um, that there's various software that you can use to magnify things or good old-fashioned magnifier if you've only got a paper record. Um, if you're really really struggling the best thing I can suggest you do is take a picture of it or scan it if you've got access to a scanner and ask other people. There are numerous, you can ask on Twitter, there are numerous Facebook groups um, devoted to family history and genealogy. You can always ask other people's opinion for what specific words say. So that's my number one tip for that. Um, here's an example of a marriage record. Um, so these are my ancestors. We looked at this on genealogy with me. So you can see that a marriage record, this is for England and Wales, um, gives you obviously the people who got married, um, roughly how old they were at the time of marriage, um, their professions, which we usually would just list the man's profession. Um, don't get me, I'll try not to get upset about that, but this one actually does give um, an occupation for Mary which is great. It tells you where they were living when they got married. Um, and it also gives you the father's details and the father's occupation. And sometimes, as you can see here, it will give you a separate not notation if uh, the father was deceased. It doesn't always do that. Sometimes people just don't know. Um, but it is helpful if you do see that on a record because it means you, even though if you don't know an exact date, it narrows down a period that you would search for a death. So, for example, if I'm going to research Samuel Ryle and try and find when he died, I know that he had died before the 24th of December 1913, because that's the date that Albert and Mary got married, and that's when they reported Samuel as having been, you know, died, had, had died before that point. Now this here's an example of a death record for Scotland and the reason I've chosen a Scottish death record is that Scottish death records have much much more information on them than English and Welsh death records do. English and Welsh death records are pretty much just going to tell you who died, what their occupation was, um, if they're a female potentially Actually, if they're a man or a woman, um, potentially who they were married to, it might say uh, wife of such and such, widow of such and such. You get the gist. Um, it will tell you what they died of, um, the only and, and what age they were when they died. 
the only other bit of useful information potentially on an English and Welsh record is who the informant was of the death. Um, and if that's a family member, that can help you um, establish that you've got the record for the right person. Um, but in terms of going back further in time, unless it's a parent reporting the death of their child, um, it's not going to help you too much to get further back. But as you can hear, see here, if you have Scottish ancestors, uh, Scottish records tell you much, much more um, for deaths after 1855 at least. So as you can see, this shows you again who the person was, what their occupation was. Here there's a notation of who his wife was. It gives you the date um, he died and where he died his age, but it also tells you who his parents were. So you can see in the middle column, we've got Alexander Jardine. Uh, he was a market gardener. And again, he died, unsurprisingly, given that Alexander the son died at 73. We'd probably assume that the parents are going to be deceased by then. Um, but yeah, so, so the father, um, market gardener, and the mother was Jane. Jardine uh, maiden name Blackstone. So that's really useful information that we wouldn't have otherwise known had it not been for this death certificate. So moving on to census records, um, I've only given you one example for a census record between 1851 and 1901 because to be honest they're pretty much the same. So they'll give you a, a list of um, addresses and who was living at that address on the night in question that the census was taken. Um, so we can see at um, number six, we've got my ancestor, Edward F. Mackey. He's noted as the head of the family. He's 31 um, and he's a monumental mason. Um, I don't think my mouse is showing up. There we go. So we're looking at this record here. Um, he's a monumental mason or a stone mason. Um, and I don't know if you can just read that. It says um, that he was born in Menai Bridge on Anglesey. Um, then we have his wife, Sarah. He was born in Waterloo, Lancashire. And then we have his children, um, Francis, Mary, Edward, Harold and Norman. And they were all born. That's incredibly hard to read, but it says Liscard in Cheshire. I hope that's how you pronounce it, Liscard. I don't actually know. We'll go with it. Um, so yeah, that's useful in that if you perhaps, so my, my um, ancestor is Francis, so I may have had an idea who his parents were, but that confirms it. And it also tells me who his siblings were. So that's really helpful information to, if you already know who siblings are, but you maybe don't know who the parents are, trying to find a group of those children on a census record can then help you make sure you've got the right individuals. So the 1911 census looks a little bit different. Um, because of the way it was provided, you get the actual return for the household. So unlike the previous record, you're not getting lots of families on one sheet, you're just getting whoever's in that household on the sheet. Um, and as you can see, it gives you slightly more information. So as well as, and this is the only census that does this incidentally, um, so as well as having who's in the household, their ages, how they relate to the head of the household, what they do for a living and where they're born, this one also tells you for adult females that are in the household, if they're married, it will tell you how long they've been married for, and how many children they've had and whether those children are living. So we can he see here that Sarah has been married to Edward for about 19 years. She's had seven children with him and all seven are surviving. Which that in itself for this time period is quite unusual. Um, normally you would see that some of the child children um, have died in infancy sadly. Um, just because of the kind of the health challenges of the time in question, really. Um, 
So that's an example um, of a census record for 1911. Oh, and the other useful or interesting, I guess, interesting thing that, that a 1911 census will tell you is information about the property where they were living. So Edward lives in a six-roomed house. Now that means Edward's doing pretty well for himself. They've got a fairly big house. Um, if you look at 1911 census records for the rest of my family that were from um, Britain, they're all like, you know, there could be m more children than this and they're living in a two-roomed house. Um, so, yeah, I guess Edward was kind of the well-off one of my ancestors. Um, here we have an 1841 census record. Um, and as you can see, uh, this has much less information. So this is the first information that collected details of who was in a household. Um, and it was very basic information. It doesn't tell you how the people in a household related to each other. So you're kind of inferring that um, a, a, somebody listed as the head of the household. So we can here we can see at the very bottom, I'm going to have to lean forward because I can't actually read it very clearly. Um, I can read the name William. Um, he's a brick maker. Um, and the, we know his rough age is 40, but those are supposed to have been done, uh, rounded up to the nearest five. Um, so it could have been anywhere around 40, basically. Here we can see that the, the person taking the census hasn't quite followed that rule because we can see that there's a, a Sarah aged 12, a Henry aged nine, Eliza who's five and it looks like an Eli who's two. Now, really, Sarah should have been rounded up to 15, I think, and uh, Henry should have been rounded up to 10. Um, yeah, so, so here this is giving you a bit more information than you would expect to see. And it's not unusual that enumerators didn't follow that rule. Um, if you're finding that in your own records, just be thankful, because it gives you a better idea of, as to how old those children actually were. So... Yes, for that particular record, um, we're assuming, so William and Elizabeth are the same age, they were assuming their husband and wife, and we're assuming that all of those children are their children, but the truth is we don't actually know without hunting down other records that feature them. All we know from the census is that they're living in the same household, um, and that William was working as a brickmaker. Now the other thing, I don't know if you can see it clearly, um, it's quite hard to read, it doesn't give you the information about where people were born on an 1841 census. All it tells you is whether the people in the household were born in the county where the census is taking place. And it will either have a, a Y for yes, an N for no. So if you look at the records on the very top of this sheet on the left hand side, it looks like the top two people, or top three people on this census uh, were not born in the county. And with the county here, um, it's Nantwich, which is in Cheshire. So the top three people uh, were not born in Cheshire. It looks to me like almost everybody on this page was. Sometimes, as you can see, it can be quite hard to distinguish between a Y and an N depending on the enumerator's handwriting. Um, I mean, to me, it looks like that is probably an N. But then you've got here, Thomas, that looks like another N, but that N looks different to the other Ns. So yeah, it, it can be a bit hard to work that out sometimes. So the final record that we can make use of um, that's like a census but isn't a census is a 1939 register which is a register of households uh, taken in September 1939 um, for the purposes of um, the impending war, World War II. Um, so you can see here from this example that you have the address, who was living at that address when the register was taken, um, their dates of birth, and 
um, their occupation. So it doesn't tell you anything else. You might have some helpful information over here on this column that's just cut off, um, which sometimes can be helpful, um, or sometimes just interesting. Um, so we wouldn't have known that um, Kenneth here He's, he's a senior clerk insurance, but we also know he's he's working for the auxiliary fire service as well. Um, the other thing you will find, because this record, this uh, record was basically then later on used uh, when the NHS came into being, is you'll quite often see notations that show for, for females, um, it shows what their married names were. So I don't know if that's what's happened here um, or if that's just an error that's been changed. Um, normally you would see later surnames written in red. See where you've got these red marks here. Normally you'd see that red pen used to make changes to surnames due to marriage. Okay, so that's basically it for source records, although you do have things like, as I mentioned earlier, probate records, which um, if, if somebody's made a will, um, that can give you an idea of who was in their family purely by, by who they're, you know, leaving their um, assets to. Um, and the other thing is military records, particularly military pension records, because they will list who the beneficiaries of a pension were if somebody did not survive the war. For example. Um, but yes, as it says here, the other method is to use DNA to valid validate your tree. Now, I don't recommend doing this in isolation. You always want to use paper records. But if you're struggling to work out if paper records are for the right people, or you're struggling to find paper records, DNA can definitely help you. And sometimes it it's just, you know, it's great to be able to see that visual backup that's, oh, well, I clearly have DNA from these ancestors or this ancestor, so I must definitely descend from them. That can be really kind of like, huh, yeah. <laughs> so as it says here, so sometimes you don't have to do research of your DNA matches. Sometimes they've done it all for you or you're a close enough match to them that what information they have shared show, shows you clearly how you relate to each other. Um, and the other thing is, if you have taken an Ancestry DNA test, I swear I'm not sponsored by Ancestry, incidentally. It's just, for me, the most helpful tool that I use on a day-in, day-out basis. Um, that's why I talk about Ancestry so much. Um, so if you've taken an Ancestry DNA test and you've built an Ancestry family tree, if you link that test kit to that family tree, Ancestry's through lines feature will kind of help you validate your tree, provided there's matches that Ancestry can say look like they descend from the same ancestors you do. Um, through lines will kick in and um, help you do this. Now to make that work, you your tree either needs to be public or it can be private, but it must be searchable. So generally, if you're making a private family tree, there's an option to, I think it's on the second page, um, there's a little tick box that you can say, I do or I don't want this to be searchable. You need to make sure that that box is ticked. So that way you can, Still keep all your research private. People won't be able to grab your sources, um, but this tool will still work. Um, if you're not bothered about any of that, just make your tree public, but make sure you mark living people as living so that you're, protect prote you're protecting the personal identifying information of your living relatives. That's really, really crucial. So let's look at this example. Um, so if you watched my genealogy with me last week, uh, we met Frank Tweeddale, um, 
Jr., I guess, Frank Tweedale Jr., who also died in 1933, much like his father. So his father was also called Frank and his mother was Elizabeth. Now, I can't quite remember if we got onto them on that genealogy with me. Um, if we didn't, we'll definitely get onto the, it this week. Um, but yeah, I have um, Frank Jr.'s birth certificate and that does show his parents as Frank and Elizabeth. Now, Jane was a relatively recent DNA match um, who came onto my mother's um, ancestry DNA list. And she shares 158 uh, centimorgans with my mum. Um, she also shares DNA with me, but it's better to work with the earliest generation that you can. So here I'm working with my mum's DNA results. Now, Jane I've actually been in contact with before. Again, not her real name, um, but Jane and I corresponded many years ago, way before DNA. So I already knew that she was a descendant of Frank and Elizabeth. Um, but if I hadn't known that, Jane has a lovely public family tree at Ancestry, which also shows that she descends from Frank and Elizabeth um, through um, their daughter, one of their daughters. Jane and my mum, there's clear DNA evidence that they both descend from Frank Tweedale and Elizabeth Child. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that they both have DNA from both Frank Senior and Elizabeth, just that they descend from one of their offspring. And we'll show that in the next example. So both Jane and my mum have another match in common who we'll call Paula. Paula's a much more distant DNA match. She only shares 31 centimorgans with my mother. I don't know how much DNA um, she shares with Jane because Ancestry don't doesn't share that information with me. Um, Paula does have a family tree at Ancestry, but it's not as extensive as Jane's tree. And because it's such a small match, that match could be quite a few branches back. So I looked at Paula's family tree um, and this made it a little bit easier because her paternal side was very clearly from Yorkshire, where both Frank and Elizabeth were from. And the other side was, um, I can't quite remember, but it was somewhere completely different. It was, there was no possibility that there was any crossover. Um, I think it was, I want to say it was German, something like that. Um, certainly it was a location where there would be no reason for that to feature in my family tree. Um, so when I was looking at Paula's paternal side tree, I did actually notice the name child in her tree. Um, but that's kind of where her tree ended and I had to try and research that child ancestor of hers to see if they met up with my child ancestors. Now, this is, um, it's a good example, but it also isn't definitive. Um, all I was able to say for sure was that Paula's child ancestor descended from a John child and his wife, Elizabeth. Um, there were rough dates on public family trees for them of around born in 1795-ish and that they were from Yorkshire, but there wasn't really any other information about them. Now, my ancestor, Elizabeth Child, her father was Thomas Child. Now, Thomas Child, there's a birth or baptism record sorry a baptism record for him which shows him as being the son of John Child and Elizabeth Hemingway and crucially John Child and Elizabeth Hemingway their births were around that 1795 period not exactly I do have some records for them which suggest when they were born and when they died um, because it's so far back I can't be absolutely certain they're for the right people but it's certainly a commonality and it's exactly the same location. So the likelihood is that my John Child and Elizabeth Hemingway are the same John Child and Elizabeth who had a child called Sarah, who is Paula's ancestor. Now, at the moment, there's no other DNA matches to work with on this particular line. So I can't really do any more for my DNA 
point of view. There might be more paper records I can try and find, um, but at this point they're probably offline. I haven't found any online. Um, so what that tells me, assuming that I'm correct that they are the same individuals, John Child and Elizabeth, the DNA then verifies that I definitely descend from Elizabeth Child. I have her DNA, but I don't have any DNA matches that only descend from the Tweeddale side. So although paper records do say, yes, I descend from Frank Tweeddale and Elizabeth Child, I can't be 100% certain that I or my mum have DNA from Frank Tweeddale. But we definitely have it from Elizabeth because if we didn't have it from, have it from Elizabeth, we wouldn't have, be sharing DNA with Paula who has no connection other than the child's. That's a bit complicated to explain, but hopefully you understand what I mean. And if you try and do this kind of um, research on your own DNA, um, it would hopefully make a bit more sense to you. And quick plug for my DNA with me series, as well as my genealogy with me series, because this is the kind of thing I'll be looking at, at re in real time through my investigations. So keep an eye out for those. So yeah, pretty much what I've just said, but a bit more succinctly, so I'm gonna just read that out for extra emphasis. So if I can prove that my common ancestors with Paula are John Child and Elizabeth Hemingway, DNA verifies that my mother has DNA from their son, Thomas, but without further matches further back in the tree, it's not possible to know how much of that DNA came from John and how much came from Elizabeth. So those are the basic methods for um, tree verification. The primary one is always going to be your source records. DNA is kind of just your, I guess, biological backup evidence that we now have access to that we didn't, you know, 10, 20 years ago. Um, so how do you keep track of all this? Well, there's different ways. You can just use your Ancestry Tree or your Family Tree software program, making a note of which source records you've been able to find. Um, for me personally, that doesn't work. I need some extra kind of ready reckoner that tells me all of the direct ancestors and what records there should be for them and which records I've found or which records I've searched for but not found. So here you've got an example. So this is my own, um, it's just a very simple Excel spreadsheet. Um, this is actually the same spreadsheet I use for all of my um, professional work as well. That's just straight genealogy work. Um, and you can see that there is a column for every single census. If I'm doing American research, I change it to reflect what American censuses are available. Um, but for the bulk of my research, which does tend to be British or Irish, this is what I use. So, um, this is the template that I'm using for the current Genealogy with Me project. Um, so you can see that only the very top part is filled out, but the idea is, and you'll see this if you watch the series, that this gets more and more filled out as time goes on. Um, but you can see that I've put in the records for the f my first three grandparents, Albert Ryle, Mary Comer and Frank Tweeddale. Um, I've put Elizabeth Baker's name in, but there's more work to do to figure out records because just purely because she's got such a common name. Um, you can see from the for the top three ancestors where I found records um, and also black marks. So. Black marks means the person wasn't alive to be featured on that particular record. So uh, Frank is, is probably a good example. So Frank was not born until 1892. So obviously I'm not going to find him on earliest census records, but he also died in 1933. So I'm not going to find him on the 1939 register. Um, the other... As you can see, the uh, other bit that's blacked out is the marriage record. And I black out the marriage record for all the males because I'm going to put the marriage record 
under the female. Now, if you wanted to, you could just repeat the same information for both, uh, both, both members of the couple. So for example, um, you can see that I've put um, index record found for Mary and Elizabeth. If I wanted to, rather than blacking out for Albert and Frank, I could just copy and paste that information in. Um, but I prefer to do it this way is it, I just find it makes a bit more sense to me. So you can use a similar kind of spreadsheet um, if you want to. And let me know, I, I said on my previous genealogy with me video, I am actually thinking about turning this into a Google Sheet template um, and making it available for people to use for their own research. Um, let me know if that's something that you would be interested in potentially using, because then I can gauge you know, whether to go ahead with sharing it or not. So that's it for this week. Um, I hope that was helpful to you. Um, let me know in the comments if um, you've already done this kind of exercise, if you found anything like glaringly wrong, or if you found out anything interesting just from going through the process of actually hunting out those records. Um, there'll be another video next week. Uh, next week video will be something a little bit different. It'll be kind of be a story time kind of um, video. Um, but tomorrow you'll have coming up my genealogy with me and on Friday my DNA with me. Um, finally, I hate to be that person that's all like, please like and subscribe. But the truth is other people won't find this video and won't find my videos unless people like you like the video and subscribe to it. It helps the magical YouTube algorithm make the videos available to other people. So please do, if you want to keep watching the content, please do subscribe um, and please like. That would be great. And I'll try not to mention that too often, but I probably will. <laughs> so that's it for now. Uh, I'll see you tomorrow if you watch my genealogy with me video. Bye bye.